much. I would like to call Felix Hong, master student from Dr. Hugh Kim lab, that he's going to talk about the role of the filament A in platelet shape change reaction. All right. Great. Thank you for the introduction. So today I'm going to be talking about how this actin binding protein called filament A can regulate the platelet shape change reactions. So as we all know, platelets are important regulators for hemostasis. Upon vascular injuries, platelet will migrate to the injury sites to initiate the formation of a clot, which then prevent us from excess bleeding. And as you might imagine, this activation is highly regulated. Too much activation can lead to arterial thrombosis, which is the underlying cause of heart attack and stroke. And too little of the activation can lead to bleeding disorders. And so platelet shape change is considered to be one of the earliest physiological response upon activation, which is also the precursor for platelet granule secretion, platelet spreading, formation of the blood clots, as well as clot retraction. But unlike many of these uh, irreversible responses here, platelet shape change is extremely dynamic and is reversible. So learning more about how platelets change their shapes will provide us with a deeper insights into the nature of platelet physiology. So in order for platelets to change their shapes, actomyosin contraction is required. So myosin is a uh, molecular motor that uses ATP as a field to generate forces onto the actin cytoskeleton. So its activation is re regulated by its myosin-like chain subunits, or MLC. So upon this phosphorylation of the MLC, myosin will adopt an active conformation, which would then bind to the actin cytoskeleton to exert this pulling force, allowing for platelets to change, sh uh, to change shape. So this MLC phosphorylation is regulated by two major pathways. One is calcium dependent and the other is calcium independent. So upon thrombin activation, a rise in intracellular calcium will lead to the activation of MLC kinase, which would then phosphorylate MLC. On the other hand, in the calcium independent pathway, thrombin will lead to the activation of this GTPase called Rho A, which would then activate the downstream uh, effector called Rho kinase or ROC. And ROC would then phosphorylate MLC phosphatase, and this phosphorylation event will actually inhibit the function of the phosphatase. So both of these pathways synergistically allowing for MLC to achieve maximum phosphorylation. So now, among the actin binding proteins, filament A, as shown in this diagram here, has been shown to regulate uh, platelet morphology and platelet functions. But what is interesting about this protein is that not only does it bind to the actin cytoskeleton and regulate its architecture, it can also act as a major scaffold for many, many signaling proteins. And the one that I'm really interested in about is Rho A and ROC. So as you might remember, Rho A and ROC, they're both important regulators for the MLC phosphorylation pathways. So which has led me to ask the question, does filament A play a role in MLC phosphorylation at all? So to answer this question, our lab has generated a tissue-specific um, conditional knockout mouse that specifically knock out filament A in the megakaryocyte lineage by using the Crelox system. So these experimental mice here will produce playlists that do not contain the filament A proteins. And so to investigate whether or not filament A uh, play a role in um, MLC phosphorylation, so I've conducted a Western blot experiment by immunoblotted for uh, phospho-MLC in both the knockout and the control upon thrombin treatment. As you can see, in the knockouts, MLC phosphorylation is significantly uh, lower compared to the control, indicating a defect um, in the MLC phosphorylation pathway uh, when filament A is absent. Furthermore, we also observed that um, these platelets have a severe defect in the clot retraction uh, reactions. So as you can see, six, at the 60 minutes, the control mouse, uh, mouse platelets have a maximum uh, retraction observed at 60 minutes. But in the, in the case of the knockouts, um, no clot retraction has been observed, indicating a defect in the my, um, actomyosin contraction pathways. So now the next logical question might be, how exactly does filament A regulate MLC phosphorylation? And so the, actually, the, uh, our lab has previously shown that um, filament A does not regulate the calcium response inside the platelet. So actually, I started looking at the calcium independent pathway before I started my project. So the easiest way, uh, the easiest way to evaluate whether or not the calcium independent pathway is dysregulated is by looking at the phosphorylation, uh, phosphorylation status of the MLC phosphatase. So, by doing another Western blot experiment again, but this time aminoblotted for the phosphorylation status of the MLC phosphatase, 
Uh, I was able to find that in the, in the film Nay Knockout Mouse, mouse platelet, um, MLC phosphatase phosphorylation is significantly lower compared to the control, indicating a defect in this calcium independent pathway. And so to further support that um, filamin A is regulating this pathway, the next protein that I started to look at is actually Rho A. So as you might remember, Rho A is a GTPase. So by conducting an active Rho A pull down, I was able to evaluate the amount of active Rho A in both the knockout and the controls. And my preliminary data show that, in the, um, indeed, in the case of the knockout, in the absence of filament A, um, Rho A activity is significantly lower than the controls, indicating that filament A is indeed play a role in this uh, regulatory pathway. However, because um, the defect was actually worse than we previously thought, so I reasoned that filament A could be regulating a different pathway to regulate um, MLC phosphorylation. And the one that caught my attention was actually PKC. So PKC in the, lecture, uh, in the literature has been shown to regulate the MLC phosphatase. And so to see if filament A regulates um, the PKC functions, I've conducted another uh, Western blot experiments, but this time I immunoblotted for it. Uh, the, BK, uh, the PKC substrate. So as you can see, in the case of a knockout, PKC is unable to phosphorylate its substrates compared to the control, indicating a role in, uh, of filament A in regulating platelet shape change, or in regulate, uh, regulating uh, PKC functions. So since both PKC and ROC kinase are regulating the MLC phosphatase, so theoretically, if I inhibit both of these proteins, it would only partially lower the MLC phosphorylation because it could be re uh, rescued by the MLC kinase pathway. However, that's not what I observed. So by doing another Western blot experiment, um, this time, if I individually inhibit PKC alone, partial lower of MLC phosphorylation is observed. And similarly, when I inhibit uh, rock kinase with Y27632 alone, partial lower of MLC phosphorylation is observed. But what is interesting is that upon the incubation of both inhibitors together, MLC phosphorylation has returned back to the basal level. And that tells me PKC is likely regulating a pathway that is distinct from the MLC phosphatase. And due to its ability to regulate many, many different um, downstream targets, as well as the complexity of signaling crosstalk, I'm not surprised that PKC can either directly or indirectly regulate the MLC kinase function. However, more, more experiment is needed to elucidate this um, pathway. So today, to sum it up, so today I've shown that filament A is an essential regulator for, uh, for MLC phosphorylation, and it does this likely by regulating, by acting as a major scaffold, by helping the localization of row A, rock kinase, as well as PKC to the cellular cortex upon uh, thrombin signaling to initiate MLC phosphorylation, thus platelet shape change. So with that, I would like to acknowledge everyone in my lab, as well as all the funding agencies for their support, and thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Molly Malika from Seattle. Uh, I was wondering, you showed us a lot of Westerns, which were super interesting. Did you do anything to directly ad uh, address or measure shape change when um, you had these different treatments? Uh, well, um, so actually I did do a microscopy study due to the time of this presentation. I did not show it. But um, so upon thrombin treatment, we did observe that there are shape change defects in the film A knockout mouse and there's like delay for lipodia formation and all that kind of stuff, but due to the time's sake, I did not show it, but yeah. Makes sense, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Raymond Adili, Bloodworks in Seattle. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, actually, um, my question is just uh, similar to the previous one. I wonder if you check the platelet spreading or more importantly, adhesion on the Static oh, yes. or yeah, so. shear condition, and also since we have a knockout mouse, if some is there, a, is there a hemostatic defect in mice? 
they bleed? Oh yes, they do have a longer bleeding time compared to the control mice. And also for the spreading assay, even though it's still kind of in like a preliminary kind of state, uh, we did observe um, there's less stress fiber being formed inside the platelets as well as like, as I mentioned, delay filopodia formation, indicating a defect in the filament knockout mice in platelet spreading. Yeah. Related to the last two questions, did you um, look at platelet spreading on different substrates, for example, on fibrinogen and von Willebrand factor to see if they it were differentially affected? Um, so, yes, yeah, so I've done it in fibrinogen cover glass, and, and also uh, other studies have, been, uh, have done uh, collagen cover glass, and apparently both of these have shown defects in um, spreading of the platelets in the filament knockout mouse. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? All right. If there is no more question, we thank Felix for a beautiful talk.